Justin Williams, TheAthletic.com, joins us. Craig Smoke, Paul Catalina, David Smoke, and this is, again, 365 Sports. Justin, thanks for your time. So there are so many lawsuits. The NCAA can't win any of them. Now there's the thought about revenue sharing, cap, $20 million, the the back pay for $1.4 billion, whatever it might be. What are your thoughts about what you actually think is going to happen to get people out of the courtroom and college athletics back to normal? Yeah, I mean, something's going to change one way or another, whether that's uh, a judge saying it, whether that's Congress saying that, or whether it's, you know, the various people uh, with power in the NCAA, you know, finding a way to come to some type of agreement. And so that's what you're seeing all of this stuff, whether it's, you know, people remember the subdivision that Charlie Baker, you know, floated back in December or uh, whether, you know, this all this talk about revenue sharing and, and the house case, you know, that it, it's coming from this house first NCA lawsuit. So at some point, you know, here in, in the relatively near future, the next couple of years, there's going to have to be some kind of watershed change. I think the biggest thing that people don't know right now is what's going to cause that. Is it going to be a court? Is it going to be a a judge is, is it going to be, you know, Charlie Baker or Greg Sankey or someone in the NCA making that decision. And, and those are kind of all these details that we're trying to hammer out. And honestly, we don't have a lot of clarity on at the moment. Justin, do you think that this would provide um, at least some sort of pause or ability over the next few years for college athletics to figure out what it needs to be in the 21st century as opposed to what it was in the middle of the 20th century that it's been trying to go back to for so long now and players can build a union and can go to those things while still getting revenue share yeah it, it does feel like a half measure or a stopgap you know in part the, the house case this is the one that you know when people hear about this case it's the one that has kind of that four billion dollar potential damages number attached to it if the NCA were to you know if were to go to trial the NCA were, were to lose that's a death sentence for the NCA so that's why there's talk of you know figuring out a settlement figuring out a way to to find you know kind of a, a revenue sharing middle ground because the worst case scenario for the NCA is that it goes to trial and they lose and they pretty much have to declare bankruptcy but I, you know I, I'm with you that I don't know that it's going to be kind of the, the final measure because that 20 million revenue sharing number per school that's been floated out there. That was, you know, an, an average number that was pulled of all the power conference uh, revenues. You know, that, that has nothing to do with em the students, you know, employee status or collective bargaining. Um, that's just kind of a number that they pulled out of thin air uh, as an estimate. So there's still a lot of different uh, things that would have to get figured out. A, a settlement in the house case would maybe take care of some of these other cases uh, that are going against the NCAA right now, but it wouldn't prevent future lawsuits from, from being brought against it. So it, it would be probably a move towards the inevitable future direction that things seem to be going. But I don't have any, you know, belief that whatever comes out of, you know, this particular potential settlement for revenue sharing, I don't think that's going to be kind of the end format that we end up having. Justin, while it's it's not going to be the end, I think we all agree on that. Is this um, you you've heard just like everybody else throughout the course of realignment? It's all this this noise that the great separation, or however you know you want to refer to it. But would this, uh, if they were to move forward in this revenue sharing model, in a roundabout way, be a, a separation? Just maybe not the one that people are thinking of when they think of like two leagues breaking off and doing their own thing, but more or less like those who choose to pay. And those who choose to say, hey, we can't do it, and this is going to be your more typical traditional college football. Yeah, absolutely. This is going to be a further dividing of, you know, power conferences and, and what is right now the group of five. And, you know, we even see uh, Dennis Dodd reported last night um, that, you know, there's the kind of that formation uh, coalition that the SEC and, and the Big Ten put together recently that they're kind of looking on their own at a revenue sharing model. So, you know, all right, so what does that look like? Do they bring the Big 12 and ACC along with them when that happens? Or, or does that further divide the, the power to that those two are kind of becoming uh but yeah from you know the this settlement 20 million dollar revenue sharing number that basically is just for the power conferences you know kessler the attorney who's, who's kind of manning up this this house uh case uh has said that it, it you know for those group of five programs they don't have the money to do that and that's also where you saw you know i think the past couple of weeks we've seen a little bit of chatter about the group of five forming their own playoff you know all of this is just attached to the growing realization and acceptance that uh you know these two things unless the same there is 
a divide that's coming. And yeah, yeah, very, very frankly, it's going to be interesting to see how they approach it from the power conference side, from the SEC Big Ten perspective, and then from the group of five, you know, does group of five make the jump and just say, hey, before we even get to this point, we're going to start our own playoff, we're going to kind of break off and do our own thing, or do they wait and see how this all plays out in a, you know, legal court sense and then, you know, kind of have the decision made for them. But it certainly feels like, uh, you know, one way or another here in the next few years, that power conference uh, divide is going to kind of just become, you know, final and, and completely cut the two se- separate divisions in half. So I don't know the exact number. We've heard that $1.4 billion, the NCAA versus House lawsuit, uh, that is around 15 or $16 million per of the power schools, the power four conferences. So there's that that's going to have to get paid. And if they go to jury, it could be $4 billion if they're not careful. So they're going to want to settle. So you have that bill that you could probably pay out over time. Then you mm-hmm. might have a $20 million salary cap. Is that a salary cap, Justin, that's for football or for universities across the board? Because some schools have 30 sports and some schools might have half that. So this is one of the many questions that we don't necessarily have an answer to because you're right. that There's the damages portion of this house case, which would be you know back pay for previous athletes. Uh, suing for the you know nil loss potential that they had and then there's the revenue sharing part of this both of which are pieces of this house case and yeah that that 20 million number what we don't know is is it beholden to title nine restraints meaning you know if you give a certain amount to football and men's basketball then you also have to give that amount uh you know to, to women's basketball or to rowing or swimming and diving kind of the same way what we have title nine with scholarship well, no, the revenue sharing, you know, the, the, as long as the opportunities, the scholarships available would be the same for women's sports. Uh, maybe the revenue sharing wouldn't have to be distributed that way. But that's not something we have an answer to or anyone has figured out. And then the other piece of that is, all right, so uh, a program has $20 million, up to $20 million that it can, you know, sh- distribute revenue sharing to student athletes. There would still potentially be NIL on top of that. So for Ohio State, $20 million, honestly, is a drop in the bucket to you. And then you might also have your collective out there that is still throwing more money at, you know, whichever players it wants to for whatever sports it wants to. So this isn't going to even, like, solve the financial disparity that is happening right now within the power conferences or even within, you know, the, the Big Ten and the SEC between those programs. There's still plenty of details that need to be hammered out and, and in no way would this kind of form like an equal playing field even among those power conference programs yeah justin title IX really complicates this in that like just very simply it just says that you have to be equitable and mm-hmm. so uh, eventually i think we're going to get to the point where we clear the hurdle where if you want baseball to have 25 scholarships and softball has 25 scholarships if you want to fund it you can fund it it's fine like you that that's at the discretion of the universities they should have to balance it out but when it comes to something like this revenue sharing would have to be revenue that they make from each thing. I would think in at least the school's mind, it's like, yes, for the sports that make money, we're happy. Like, it's easier for us to say this, but for everything else, what are we really sharing? Yeah, and this is, you know, the the Title IX um, situation has come up in all of these discussions when the the subdivision that Charlie put out in December, when that was brought up and, and the potential of bringing NIL and house. Well, right now, NIL payments, you know, collectives aren't beholden to, to Title IX restrictions. So if, if NIL was brought within athletic departments, would that then be beholden to Title IX? Kind of the same thing we're talking about with revenue sharing. So I think whether, again, whether it's a court that decides it, um, whether it's Congress that decides it, one of the biggest pieces of all of these changes moving forward are how does Title IX factor into this? And this is also why you hear, you know, from the athletic department side, from the administrative side, you hear a lot of these programs, a lot of schools saying, hey, if all these changes happen, we're going to lose a bunch of sports. And, and the reason they're saying that is because it would basically come down to probably football and men's basketball as your traditional revenue-making sports. And then, you know, a lot of them are claiming, hey, maybe we'll just have uh, the women's scholarships that kind of meet that football, bat, men's basketball threshold. And that talks about maybe getting rid of baseball or getting rid of men's soccer or, you know, men's swimming and diving and things like that. I mean, we're a long way off from that. But when you start to hear people on the academic or, excuse me, on the administrative athletic department side making that argument, this is why they're talking about it because we don't know exactly what role Title IX is going to play in all of this. I've said this 
for a while and, and it probably didn't register very well because we didn't know what the next level was and now we see the revenue sharing cap etc i always thought that congress needed to do their own job because they don't get enough done in the first place but if title nine or women's sports start to be deleted to me that's when they would start to feel political pressure would you agree yeah i think so but all of this i think is also why congress is not really you know jumped at the chance sure they've held hearings and had meetings and things like that but we've never really seen kind of a full-throated concerted effort from anyone or either side of congress to like right. step in and solve this you know congress again i'm i'm not a political reporter but they don't really seem to have a problem kind of sticking their nose in certain situations this is one where they're like yeah they i think see the same kind of issues or potential problems that could pop up and you're right maybe title nine is the thing that makes them realize hey Someone needs to jump in and be the adult in the room and to figure out that we don't want to lose opportunities for women's sports or just some of these other Olympic sports that would, you know, maybe pushes Congress this way. But I also think there's a lot of people in Congress that are looking at it saying, why don't we let, you know, some of the court cases kind of resolve and mm -hmm. see what happens there and then move forward because all the problems that we're talking about, a lot of them don't have obvious or easy solutions. That's something that people in athletics departments have known for a long time. Okay. We, we, Justin, thank you very much. We lost you. Uh, I don't know if it's the, our guest. Yeah, that I don't might know. It's be back us. To back. I don't because know. Because Dennis Dodd had a little bit of a blip there, too. Justin Williams, theathletic.com. Appreciate him being on the show today on the many different.